are here, I want to extend a special greeting to my Nazarene brothers and sisters. Um, just glad that you're here. I want to start just with a few happy things, and then I want to explain to you a few solemn things and kind of maybe give you a little bit of context about what we are going to be uh, doing here. First of all, to my Nazarene brothers and sisters, thank you for sharing your pastor with us this evening. Um, I really love your pastor. In fact, if, um, if my church fired me and I still lived in the area, um, don't get any ideas, elders. Um, I would attend your church just because I'm not Nazarene, but I follow Jesus and I really love your pastor. And he has been a dear, dear friend, and I'm so blessed that he'll get to preach here in our sanctuary, and I know that he will do a very, very wonderful job. So thank you, thank you, thank you for giving him kind of the freedom to mingle with the colleagues, and uh, he is a, a special blessing um, to me. Now, this is a solemn remembrance of our Savior's death. And oftentimes, one of the temptations at a Good Friday service is to kind of just wink and nod and like, we're going to pretend to be sad at Good Friday, but we're just kind of going to all know Easter's coming. That's not the purpose of a Good Friday service. And if one thing we have learned in the past year is that we need to face darkness. We need to face our grief. We need to even face sometimes the hopelessness that we feel during difficult and one of the things that Good Friday teaches us is that God himself went into the feeling of God forsakenness. One author wrote this, do not use Good Friday to anticipate Sunday. This is not Advent with pregnancy giving us hope of a new beginning. Good Friday is a day to grow in empathy, to stretch ourselves to understand the original disciples, and our dozens of neighbors who do not see Sunday coming. Or, if I may be so bold, to understand those parts of even ourselves that still do not see hope. There is nothing powerful about hope unless we understand despair. About resurrection until we understand death. If we look past Friday, we not only declare Sunday irrelevant, but we also leave thousands of hurting people on the margins, unheard in their despair, and dismiss as too negative in their grief. On Good Friday, we wrestle with our own hopelessness. We wrestle with our own pain. And that's the most Christian thing we can imagine. So thank you for being here on this holy and good Friday. Our service begins with a reading from Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5, and verses 15 and 16. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. This is God's word. Let us pray. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. King Jesus, we ask you this Good Friday evening 
that the message about the cross would continue to save us from the foolishness, wisdom, and discernment of this world. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of the name of the one who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, and all of us said together.
from the Old Testament, comes from Isaiah 52, 13, and will take us through Isaiah 52, 20. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marvelous is appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. So that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others man of suffering, acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we counted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of stricken for the transgression of my people. He made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain, to make his life an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through 
him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light, and shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, a servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them in their minds. And yet, their sin and lawless acts will I, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no higher any sacrifice for sin, no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way opened for us through the through the curtain that is his body, since we have great priests over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now stands empty. Our Lord gives us sun. The crowd has grown weary. The war is done. The blood stained should cross be to which you were nailed. Tears of forgiveness for lives that fail. The tomb that now holds you puts a chill in my heart. I wait and I wonder for you. has been empty for one day and two the tomb looks around now how can it be true they say he is risen they 
they say he's alive. The glory of heaven shines in his eyes. He walks with disciples. Resurrection complete. Are we in the wonder? tonight comes from John chapter 19, picking up with the second part of verse 16, and I'll read through the end of the chapter, John chapter 19 and verse 16. So they took Jesus carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic 
Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scriptures say. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was a day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies of, left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great sol solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though, a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Hearing we hear the word of God to the people of God, and so we say, thanks, thanks be to God. God. You probably shouldn't have come tonight. I remember when I was little, I would sometimes get a splinter in my finger or my foot. There was a park adjacent to a lake in the town where I grew up, and at the pinnacle of that park was a playground, a little castle made entirely of wood. That was a favorite place of ours to play. We even had a name for it, Deb's Castle. <laughs> Deb, of course, is my mother. And she was the queen of that <laughs> castle. Deb's castle was the perfect place to get a splinter. And whether it was a splinter 
I thought while rounding a corner in the dry and aging castle, or one that I got home on the handrail that followed the stairs to our basement, I would always do the same thing. I would crawl into Mother's lap, and she would begin by looking at the splinter. Prid. P-R-I-D. Prid. It is a homeopathic drawing style, all natural. Keep out of reading children. <laughs> Walker Pharmaceutical Company. See directions on back. I think my mother believes in that small orange tin of drawing salve as much as she believes in anything else in the entire world. I'm glad she's never had to choose between the two of us. <laughs> that is what my mother would put on my finger or my hand or foot along with a bandage whenever I would get a splinter printed. Leave this print on it for a day and that splinter will come right to the surface would say. That terrified me as a child. Because I knew what came after the prid. And it was often quite painful and sometimes involved a recently sterilized needle. There they crucified Jesus. And with him two others. One on either side. With Jesus between them. Francis J. Maloney, a biblical scholar, notes in his commentary on John's Gospel the importance of this detail, Jesus between them. He sees it as a fulfillment of what Jesus says in the 12th chapter, verse 32. He says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So Maloney sees this idea of Jesus being between these two other people on a cross as a fulfillment that Jesus is already at his death, at his crucifixion, drawing people to himself. As soon as he is lifted up from the earth, those others join him. He believes that the two that are crucified with Jesus are there to show that in his suffering, Jesus begins to draw others to himself. Now this is why you probably should not have come tonight. Because I think Christ's suffering on the cross works a great deal like my mother's drawing salve. When we look at Christ as he suffers, our own splinters of suffering come to the surface. And sometimes it's painful. That's why we call this, that's why calling today, this Friday, good, is somewhat absurd. Take a moment and look around at one another here. Each of us has a splinter. Each of us has a piece of suffering inside of us. And tonight, by coming here, by being drawn to Christ as he is lifted up, each of us risks having our own suffering drawn to the surface. Good Friday has a way of reminding us of our splinters, of holding them up so that we have to take a good look at them. I asked my mother if I could also share this with you, and without hesitation, she said, yes. Three years before I was born, my mother was pregnant. But on Good Friday in 1990, she had a miscarriage. She's often talked with me about how that was a very lonely experience. People didn't know how to talk with her about that. But to this day, we do not remember the anniversary of that loss on the date it happened. But every year, Good Friday becomes the time that we feel that loss again. That we remember that it 
comes close to the surface. Good Friday has a way of drawing our splinters to the surface. There they crucified Jesus, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. With Jesus between them. Jesus between them. John's Gospel seems to forget to mention who these two were. The Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, all agree these two were bandits. But John's Gospel is not so sure about that. And I wonder if it's because John wanted the first readers of the Gospel to not make any assumptions about those two, but actually to read themselves into the story as the ones on either side of Jesus. What's helpful for us to remember is that John is writing this gospel to a church that is struggling with how to be Christian without Christ present in the body. The question they're asking is, where is Jesus? So John tells this story, and the answer becomes, Jesus is between us in our suffering. The crucified Christ draws those who suffer to himself, and his presence is with them in their suffering, right between them. Elie Wiesel was a Holocaust survivor and educator and a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. He writes of his experience as a Jew in a Nazi concentration camp. One day they were going to hang three prisoners as an example and to make everyone watch. One of them was a young boy. Ellie writes about how this boy was so small and light that he struggled to die. He says, as he stood there, he heard a man behind him asking, Where is merciful God? Where is he? All these prisoners, thousands of them, were forced to stand and watch, to walk past them in a procession, to see every gruesome detail of the murder of these three Jews. As Wiesel marched by, this is what he described seeing. The third rope was still moving. The child, too light, was still breathing. And so he remained for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, writhing before our eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was red, his eyes not yet extinguished. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, For God's sake, where is God? And from within me, I heard a voice answer, Where he is? This is where. Hanging here from this gallows. This story reminds us that Jesus is found between those who suffer, always, in their suffering. That's where Jesus is. And as Jesus draws those who suffer to himself, he forms a community. This is what happens when he sees his mother and the beloved disciple. He gives the mother to the disciple and the disciple to the mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This is a picture of Christ on the cross drawing people to himself, and in doing so, forming a community. Which, by the way, is another reason you probably should not have come tonight. Because tonight, as Christ suffers, he has drawn us to himself, and as we see him suffering, our splinters of suffering are drawn to the surface. But then, Jesus tells us that he drew us here for a reason, to make a new family.
and that now we are responsible for one another. I would like to look around once again, see those who are here. All of these saints, with all these splinters, are now your sisters and brothers for whom you are responsible. Thanks a lot. And what does Jesus do next? Well, this is when it starts to get fun. He drinks wine. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. And so they bring the sour wine to him, and they put it on the sponge, and they lift it up to him. And the synoptic gospel, they'll say, he doesn't drink it. He says, no, I can't drink that. But John's gospel says, he drank it. When he had received the wine, when he had received the wine, he said, it is finished. One of my favorite spiritual writers, Henry Nouwen, writes this little book called Can You Drink the Cup? In this book, he meditates on Jesus asking his disciples, who are bickering over who's going to sit on his right and left in glory, he asks them, can you drink the cup that I drink? Referring to his suffering. Now he meditates on this and says that this cup we are invited to drink is a cup of sorrow and a cup of joy. But that in drinking the cup of Christ, a fellowship is created. This is what he says. In whatever country or culture we find ourselves, having a drink together is a sign of friendship, intimacy, and peace. Being thirsty is often not the main reason to drink. We drink to break the ice, to enter into a conversation, to show good intention, to express, express friendship and goodwill, to set the stake for a romantic moment, to be open, vulnerable, accessible. That's what it means to drink the cup. And I can't help but wonder, what if that is true of Christ on the cross as well? That he doesn't drink the wine only because he's thirsty, but because he wants to make himself open, vulnerable, accessible, because he wants to give a sign of friendship, intimacy, and peace, because he wants to be with us, between us, drinking our cup of joy and sorrow. Another reason that this gospel was written in the first place to those first early Christians was because these people who had been, who were Jews, that began to follow Christ, eventually as they grew more and more formed in, in Christ's way, there was a break between those who followed Christ and those who did not. And the Jewish Jewish sect of, called Christians eventually were no longer welcome in the synagogues anymore. And as this gospel is being written, they're wrestling with all the relational complications of following Jesus. One of those with, with which that they were no longer welcome in the synagogues. So they're asking the question, how do we worship now, now that we can't gather in that space anymore? Who are we apart from what we had before. They're struggling with this recent memory of broken relationship. I can't help but wonder if maybe we find ourselves in a similar situation. The pandemic led us way out of our normal worship practices. And now we wonder, what will it be like to worship in a post-COVID-19 reality? Church meetings tried to find the new normal, and what it will look like for the church to reset. And we're left asking, who are we apart from what we had before? Who are we? And now we're beginning to struggle with the relational implications of the last 12 months for the church. So I want to confess to you that one splinter I have brought with me tonight is the pang of seeing many of our church family members leave our congregation during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not unique to my church. Both of us feel this. Maybe Christ is between us as we wrestle with these questions 
and as the loss of the pandemic starts to sit in. And then maybe, and that's a big maybe, Christ is even between us and those who have left our churches. Now that's difficult to say, because two nights ago I had a dream that I was with some of these people and I was really giving them peace of my mind. <laughs> but here's the annoying thing. And this is why I shouldn't have come tonight, for the record. If Christ is indeed between us, then I can't look at them without looking past the suffering Christ. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, I know this is exactly where you expected me to go <laughs> next, but bear with me. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo, or Leo, Raph, Donnie, and Mikey for short. <laughs> they're just turtles, and they're also mutants of the size of people, and they're teenagers, so they love pizza, and they're ninjas, so they fight crime. How did the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles learn to be ninjas, you ask? That's a great question for Good Friday. Allow me a rabbinical move, if you will. Does anyone happen to know the name of their teacher, their trainer? Splinter. Splinter teaches them what they need to know. Splinter shows them how to move through the world differently than everyone else. Splinter is their source of wisdom. Could we allow our splinters to teach us? To give us a new way of moving through the world? Could we allow our splinters to be a source of wisdom? Let me ask one more question. What is a splinter, anyhow? It's a fraction of something else. The splinter that lodged itself in the soft skin of my palm was actually a piece of my mother's castle, a fragment of her queendom inside me. So our splinters can become little pieces of God's kingdom being revealed among us. And when you put together all the splinters of human suffering, you find that together they form a cross. And it is there on the cross of human suffering that God in the flesh meets us and suffers it all, eternally lodging God's self between us. I want to leave you on this Good Friday because you did come anyhow with a prayer. This prayer is called a liturgy for those who share a common loss. It was written for a group of people who all lost one person that was dear to them all. For us, that might be those who were taken from us by COVID-19, or perhaps for us, that common loss is the time that we lost during the pandemic, leaving us more like strangers than we ever expected to be. Or perhaps that common loss is those who have left our churches. Or perhaps that common loss is a splinter of the cross. Or perhaps tonight, on this Good Friday, that common loss Christ. Listen to how this prayer begins. O oh, Christ.
Christ who mediates the spaces between us be present in our midst. For we have lost one we love and we do not wish the outworkings of this pain to further isolate and divide us, adding to our suffering any loss of relationship with one another. Therefore, God, give us grace and guidance to love each other well in this heartbroken season. If we are to foster a holy community, even in our grief, we must begin by first confessing the truth Though our lives are closely twined and our grief is shared, the patterns of our grieving will surely be as different as our personalities. One of us might need space and silence to slowly process this loss, while another might need to talk about it often. One might need frequent distractions from their sadness so as not to be overwhelmed, while another might be unable to focus on anything but their grief. One might feel all emotions magnified, while another is too numb to feel anything. One might work long hours or exercise till they're exhausted, while another may hardly find motivation to get out of bed. One might process the worst of their grief in a few short months or even weeks and seem to be moving on again with life, while another might return to a sense of normalcy very slowly and over a course of years. There is no one right way to grieve, so there will be much room for confusion, misunderstanding, and hurt feelings between us. God, give us sympathy and compassion for one another. Indeed, if we are to love one another well in this wounded season, we must not burden others with expectations for how they should navigate their own share of sorrow. Rather, it is a season in which we must study each other's hearts, learning to observe, to listen, to consider what the other is thinking and feeling and what they might need, but never expecting it will be the same as our own need and not accusing or condemning when it isn't. Give us sensitivity and insight, O oh Lord. Fill us afresh and repeatedly with love and compassion for one another. Sharing our grief with others who grieve differently will not be easy. We will not do it perfectly. Grace must be our rule, for we will need to forgive one another often. But if we would grow nearer, even in this season of deep sorrows, we must each strive to be mindful of and vulnerable with one another. And also to always be patient and forgiving and kind. Even as you have borne our sorrows, O Christ, let us now learn to carry one another's griefs. Indeed, O Spirit of God, hear our prayer and knit our hearts closer that we might serve each other well, sharing our burdens growing in increasing love rather than increasing frustration, and so becoming to each other sources of strength and consolation, even in the midst of our diverse ways of grieving. Let us learn, O oh Lord, to offer comfort and to receive comfort from one another.
time together meditating upon the seven last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. So I invite you just to listen and to contemplate Christ and him crucified. At the conclusion of the seven last words, Pastor Matthew will lead us in a final benediction and then we will then be dismissed in silence. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. 
while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Silence with our God in Eucharist. 